So welcome to this video in which we'll talk about the differences between finite dimensional and infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So um, we'll start with uh, looking back at our finite dimensional case extended to a very um, natural extension in infinite dimensions. And then uh, we'll talk about, uh, um, about some more tricky um, infinite dimensional vector spaces on, on real number axes. So um, in the first postulate, we said that every physical state of a quantum system could be associated with a vector in that Hilbert space. And then in finite dimensions, we could expand this in a basis um, n and just take coefficients over that um, basis, over those basis states. Um, and we had a basis that had a finite number of, uh, of basis states in it. So then n was finite. Now we can of course go to a denumerably infinite dimensional Hilbert space by just considering an infinite number of dimensions, an infinite number of basis states. So we can write our phi then as a sum over our states n, but now we'll have an infinite sum. Okay, that's a fairly easy extension. Um, we could think of our phi as the basis states in an infinite square well potential, um, and uh, we, we'd have an infinite number of them. So that's, uh, that's of course, uh, an easy system where, uh, where this would apply. However, there's a constraint that we have to add in addition um, to this definition, and that's to ensure um, boundedness. So if we look at the scalar product of phi with itself, or the norm of phi, um, that will be the sum over uh, the absolute values of these coefficients squared, and that will have to be finite. So since we have a sum now, or a series or, um, with an infinite number of terms, this uh, has the potential to diverge, and if this diverges, that would mean that our, uh, um, our, our normalization conditions wouldn't work, for example. So this norm has to be finite for elements of our Hilbert space. Of course, for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, this is always uh, satisfied and then the norm is always bounded because we're just summing over a finite number of uh, elements and our CN obviously um, are always finite numbers. So what will actually be a requirement on our Hilbert spaces in quantum mechanics is what is called separability. So um, we'll, be we'll have to be able to find a finite dimensional subspace, h sub n, that's uh, um, such that any state phi in our infinite dimensional Hilbert space um, will be able to be approximated, approximated to arbitrary precision um, with an element in this uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space. So, of course, in the case of, uh, of this uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert space where we have, where we just extend our basis to an infinite number of basis states, one could imagine how this would be uh, easily um, obtained if we just, for example, um, sort our, uh, our basis states along the direction in which, um, in which phi um, has the largest coefficients in Cn. So at some point the Cn's are going to become small uh, and we can just, uh, um, we can cut off the series there. So um, written mathematically, it means that for all numbers or for all small values epsilon or uh, um, precision that we require there must be a number n um, that allows us to define this finite dimensional Hilbert space such that the norm of phi minus phi n is, is uh, less than uh, epsilon so we, we can arbitrarily close we can get arbitrarily close to phi with our phi n where phi n is now in this finite dimensional basis so this is what is called separability. We can uh, basically um, approximate our, our infinite dimensional Hilbert space with a finite dimensional subspace. Um, this is also called a strong convergence um, requirement uh, or convergence in the norm. And there's also, of course, if there's strong convergence, there's weak convergence, which only applies to uh, the scalar product of two um, different, uh, um, different states. And so that, uh, um, so strong convergence implies weak convergence, not the other way around, but we won't use weak convergence. So that's the requirement of separability that we are able to find um, a, a subspace in which we can, a finite dimensional subspace in which we can uh, approximate our element of the infinite dimensional subspace. Okay, so some examples of Hilbert spaces. So the one that we just talked about um, is called lowercase l two or L2. Um, and so we ex express our state phi as an infinite sum over our basis states n. And, and we'll imply, uh, impose the additional requirement that the norm of phi is bounded. This space 
satisfies closeness. So if uh, phi and chi are both in this uh, in this space L2, then phi plus lambda chi will have to be in that space L2. Um, and then uh, that of course means that the norm of phi plus lambda chi will have to be uh, have to be finite, will have to be bounded. The scalar product in this space is just as before, is defined as the, as the um, infinite um, sum of uh, dn star with cn. Um, we can show that this satisfies the Schwartz inequality, and of course, as I already pointed out, this space is, uh, is separable as well. So that's a, an example of a finite, infinite dimensional Hilbert space that we will use. Another one that we will use is uh, what is called L2 between the interval AB, and this is the first example of a, uh, um, a functional Hilbert space. So now the elements of this Hilbert space are functions, phi of x, on an interval a, um, a to b. And these functions, in addition to being just regular functions, they have to be uh, square integrable. So the norm of phi, or the norm squared, is the integral between a and b of the square of that function, and that has to be a converging integral. So that means that that's what is me meant with uh, the requirement that these are square integrable functions. So again, this Hilbert space is closed, that both phi and chi are in, in L2 over AB, then uh, the integral over AB between, of uh, the, the magnitude of phi x and lambda chi x um, will have to be diver uh, convergent as well. Um, we've of course used the definition here to introduce our, our scalar product in some sense, but more generally the scalar product between chi and phi, two elements of this Hilbert space, is the integral between A and B of chi star and phi. Um, we can use um, integral properties sh to show that this satisfies the Schwartz inequality. Um, and we can show that this space is separable by using uh, what we've uh, learned in uh, Fourier analysis for on a finite interval between A and B. Um, because what we can do is we can introduce basis vectors phi sub n, which are given by these functions with an exponent of i times n x over normalized, of course, over the interval b minus a, and then there's some pi's in there, but you know, these are the, the Fourier basis functions over that interval between a and b. And so what we can do now is we can approximate any function phi arbitrarily well by choosing enough Fourier coefficients in our expansion of uh, phi, uh, in our expansion of phi um, in, in its Fourier components. So that will uh, give us the fact that this is a separable space and so it's a valid uh, Hilbert space for quantum mechanics. We can of course extend this if we go from with a to minus infinity, b to plus infinity. Um, it's a little bit more complicated to show that this also satisfies separability, um, but it's certainly, uh, um, so you, you would certainly not be surprised to hear that that is a separable space as well, based on similar arguments um, that just have more mathematic uh, mathematics uh, for, for their um, um, justification. So if uh, our spaces have to be restricted, um, one could think that this might extend to operators as well. So let's consider an operator on this space L2, um, which is the one where uh, we have denumerably um, infinite dimension where we have a set of uh, basis states n. So we can write our phi in terms of coefficients and then apply the operator on phi, which will have an impact on the coefficients. So we'll look in particular here at an operator A that maps Cn onto n times Cn. So our state A on phi will be um, the sum over n Cn times the basis state n. Uh, this is a linear operator, but um, there's an additional uh, requirement we'll have to put on this operator because it only generates a, a phi that's a member or that's an element of L2 for a subset of elements in L2. There are, in other words, um, elements in L2 such that A on phi is not an element in L2. And in particular, we can construct one if we look at C sub n, that's one over n, then phi you know, is indeed, uh, has a finite norm. Um, it's a proper element of L2. The sum over Cn squared is, uh, is a converging series. However, if we look at now at, um, at A on the state phi, then the sum over n c n squared is divergent. We just get a, a sum of ones, right? Uh, so that is a divergent, um, a, a divergent series. And so the element, 
phi that we started from cannot be part of the domain of the operator A, this domain DA, such that um, all elements of that domain uh, result in an element that uh, is part of the, the Hilbert space. Uh, if the domain of an operator is the entire Hilbert space, or in other words, if for all elements of the Hilbert space, um, A on that element is bounded, then A is called the bounded operator. Now, I hate to break it to you, but unfortunately in quantum mechanics, um, we are going to encounter many unbounded operators. And uh, one of them we'll introduce in just a second. But let's look first at uh, operator X on uh, the interval 0, 1. So we'll introduce the operator x as the operator when working on a state phi um, returns the function x times phi times the original function. So the operator x just picks up the the um, the value of x and multiplies it with the function. So for all phi in or uh, or Hilbert space, um, the norm of x phi will be bounded. If we take the integral of uh, x phi squared um, for, for all functions where the integral over phi squared is bounded, then of course that integral x phi squared will be uh, bounded as well. Now let's consider another operator, the momentum operator, where p um, causes the, uh, the, the derivative, the d dx, but then a multiplication with minus um, i over h, uh, minus i h bar. So that operator is unbounded. So um, there exists, or there exist, plural, um, functions or elements phi um, in the Hilbert space such that the norm of the momentum operator on phi diverges. So that's an unbounded operator, and, and naturally we will be using that operator a lot. Uh, so unbounded operators are unfortunately going to be something we have to, uh, we have to be aware of. So for example, let's look at this function uh, phi x that's x to the power minus a quarter. So the, the normal phi is the integral over um, the x minus a quarter squared. So that's x to the minus one half. So that integral is two. Um, if we look at uh, the integral of x times phi, so we just multiply with x, we find three halves. Um, that's also finite. But now if you look at the momentum operator, we take the derivative, we end up with an integral uh, of uh, um, x to the minus five halves, and that integral will of course diverge um, due to the um, due to the the, uh, the asymptote at zero. Okay, so to talk about the momentum operator p, we'll have to restrict our discussion to the domain of p, um, which will be a subset of uh, the Hilbert space that we're working in. Uh, in uh, in the case of the a position operator x we'll have to uh, restrict ourselves to the domain as well, technically, but it is the entire Hilbert space, so that's not going to be a restriction. Now, that also means that expressions such as the sum of two operators only really apply to the intersection of the domains. It doesn't make sense to talk about an operator when, there's, uh, when, when we're outside of its domain, um, and that intersection between this, those two operators could be empty. So then, even though we can write down a plus b, it wouldn't mean anything because a and b have no intersecting um, elements in their domains. So let's look, for example, at uh, the commutator of x and p. Um, so we'll see that this is equal to i h bar times the identity operator. So these are, of course, operator expressions. So we have an operator on the left-hand side, an operator on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the identity operator. The identity operator will, of course, have as its domain, the entire Hilbert space. Uh, we've seen just before that we have to restrict the domain of our momentum operator, which occurs in this commutator, to um, a subset of, uh, of the Hilbert space. So the domain of this commutator will also be a subset of the Hilbert space. So we have something on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side that has the, Hilbert, the entire Hilbert space as its domain. Um, on the left-hand side, um, an expression that has a subset uh, as, uh, as its domain. So naturally that expression will only be valid in the, the intersection of the domains of those two, uh, of those two um, sides of the equation. And so what is technically more correct to write is that the commutator of x and p is a subset um, or is, is the same as this operator on the domain um, where i 
uh, where, where uh, the, the domains intersect. So the operator of uh, commutator X and P is, uh, is equal to that other operator only on the domain um, that is associated with uh, the commutator. And the domain of X of the commutator of X and P is smaller than the domain of, uh, um, of, of the identity operator. So it's clear that we're going to have to be careful with both our vector space elements to ensure that they're bounded and then with operators to ensure that they don't generate unbounded elements. Or in other words, we only apply the operators to uh, elements in their domain. Now let's see how that applies to adjoints of operators. So um, we'll uh, consider the adjoint of the operator um, based on the definition through the scalar product. So if the scalar product of chi and a phi is equal to the scalar product of a adjoint um, chi and phi, so that will be the definition of uh, the operator a, um, a adjoint. If uh, a um, adjoint or if a um, is, uh, is Hermitian, then uh, um, so a will be Hermitian if that, uh, um, that expression is obtained by, uh, by equality of a and uh, a, a dagger. So uh, if um, an operator satisfies this expression where chi scalar product with a phi is equal to a chi scalar product with phi, then a is Hermitian. However, just in general, a dagger or a adjoint could have a different domain than a. So if we write that um, a dagger is equal to a, um, that's a, a stronger statement than a dagger um, is, is a subset of a, uh, similar to our expression for um, the commutators above. So, uh, so we'll have to be careful about uh, domains of uh, a adjoint as well. So for example, let's look at this special operator a, um, a0, which is our momentum operator. Um, so i h bar minus i h bar d d x, um, and it's on the domain. So we'll only consider um, the the function for which um, this operator actually returns something that is part of um, L two between zero and one. So that domain will be all square integrable functions, because that's the Hilbert space, which are differentiable because I take the derivative, and for which the derivative is a square integrable function. Um, in addition as you'll see in a second, we have to impose the requirement that they also satisfy these boundary conditions. That phi 0 and phi 1 are equal to 0. So uh, at boundary conditions, um, this function goes to 0 at the boundaries. Uh, of course, you see that this is going to be something that, uh, that, uh, that occurs, um, for example, in, uh, in the case of the infinite square well potential. So now for this to be a Hermitian operator, we, ex, uh, we, we evaluate both of these expressions, chi with a phi and a chi with phi, um, but applied to a, um, a zero. So the scalar product is the integral between zero and one of chi star um, with the derivative of phi. And then the second integral is the in integral over uh, um, the derivative of chi conjugate uh, multiple, multiplied with phi we can apply integration by parts to evaluate this further. And uh, if I do integration by parts, I'll pick up this boundary term. Otherwise, the terms will be the same and they'll cancel in the difference. But the thing that's left is this boundary term. Now, the boundary term is why I impose these boundary conditions so that this goes to zero. Um, if we impose the boundary conditions, then um, we find that uh, both phi at zero and phi at one is, is equal to zero. Um, and so uh, we obtain um, the, the, the required proof that this, uh, this operator is a Hermitian operator um, if, uh, if, we are, um, if we impose these boundary conditions. Now, um, what is strictly speaking happening here is that uh, the, um, the domain of our adjoint operator or our Hermitian conjugate here is, um, is larger than the domain of A itself. Because by imposing the boundary conditions at, um, at, one and ze at zero and one on phi, this term disappears. That means we don't have to impose those boundary conditions on chi. Chi can be anything. Uh, chi could, uh, could have non-zero values at the boundaries. So the domain on which the adjoint operator operates here is larger than the domain 
of the operator itself. This is the situation that we obtain when we have um, what is called a, a Hermitian operator. So um, there's of course going to be a stronger condition um, which we obtain when the domain for A and um, the adjoint of A are the same. So let's look at that um, in, in a bit more detail. So if we now introduce another um, operator, A, a C, which is similar as the expression above, but now with the domain defined by a boundary condition that phi um, at one is equal to some constant C times phi at zero. And uh, we'll uh, impose a normalization on this, uh, this constant C. So it's just a, a phase difference in something. So now if we look at this uh, expression and we apply again integration by parts, um, we impose the boundary condition, then what we'll find is that we obtain um, this expression. So it's not, uh, it's not clear yet um, that, uh, um, so, so we'll have to impose an, another condition before this is equal to zero. Now what's that condition that we have to impose before this is equal to zero? The condition is that chi must satisfy the same boundary condition. So in this case, if we impose this boundary condition um, on phi, we'll find that we have to impose the same boundary condition on chi. And so the domains of A adjoint or AC adjoint and the domain of AC itself um, is, uh, is the same. They both have to satisfy the same boundary conditions. They're both in the, sa the same subset of uh, L2 between zero and one. And this is what we will call a self adjoint operator. So one where those domains are the same. In contrast with the Hermitian operator, where the domain of the operator is, is part of the domain of uh, um, the adjoint of the operator. So of course this, uh, even though we started with very similar expressions here, um, all of the, the difference between these operators A0 and AC is in, in the boundary condition and in the domains that we've chosen. Um, and we could pick different values of C even. Um, so those are different um, operators because they have different domains and so they'll end up with different eigenvalues and different eigenvectors. So it will be important that we consider the domains and operators um, instead of assuming that that doesn't matter because they have uh, um, a different, they have an impact on uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So talking about eigenvalues, um, so that will allow us to write a spectral decomposition of Hermitian matrices, uh, Hermitian operators and uh, as physicists, we'll actually use the, the fact that A is Hermitian when we actually talk about self-adjoint operators. Um, just want to point that out. Um, but um, in contrast with finite dimensional spaces, if A is Hermitian, or in other words, self-adjoint, um, there's not guaranteed to be a solution for um, our eigenvalue equation. So if we now consider, for example, again, our momentum operator, uh, and uh, I've defined this here on L2 on the real axis. Uh, of course, then there's no boundary conditions, but obviously there's, uh, um, there's additional uh, conditions. So I'm, I'm defining this really here on the domain of operator P on the real axis. So if I uh, look at this eigenvalue equation, that becomes my differential equation. I have my minus I H bar um, with the derivative of phi has to be equal to our eigenvalue A times phi. We can solve this differential equation just gives us our exponentials of i a x over h bar multiplied with a constant c. Now this function that we've obtained by solving the differential equation is not part of, uh, of our Hilbert space because if we take the, 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 um, the square integral, uh, so of course the phase, the e to the i a x term um, uh, disappears but um, we'll have the square of the, of the norm of C. Uh, and so if we integrate that between minus and plus infinity, then that of course diverges. So we'll have to be careful in considering um, these infinite dimensional spaces because it turns out that uh, um, some of the, the things we may be used to from finite dimensional spaces, such as the fact that there will be solutions for Hermitian operators to the eigenvalue equations, uh, those are not all going to translate as easily um, to uh, infinite dimensional spaces. But we'll spend some time and a lot of time um, talking about, uh, about these infinite dimensional spaces for the rest of the semester. Okay, that's it for this video.